Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Good? Man, it's good to see y'all. It's good to worship with you. Yeah. You guys can have a seat this morning. If I haven't met you yet, my name is David. I'm the lead pastor here. And we've got a lot of ground to cover in our Colossians uh, verses for today. And we don't have a ton of time to do it. So I will just jump right in. If you want to pull out your Bibles, we're in Colossians chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible, we actually have that on the screen behind us. So Colossians 3, starting in verse 22, here's what we read. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done, and there is no partiality. And then we'll finish in 4.1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. I told you all the way back in April when we started in this series, I mentioned the fact that I like teaching through books of the Bible because, and I like going verse by verse because it forces you to confront all of scripture, all of it. And I don't think that today will be any exception to that. I have enjoyed this Colossians series. Have you guys enjoyed it? Man, I've been, yeah, I've been challenged by God's word. I've been encouraged by God's word. And believe it or not, we are just two weeks from the finish line. So we've got this week and two more, and we will finish Paul's letter to the Colossians. And so I think that it's helpful as we're getting ready for this sprint to the finish to actually look back on the ground that we have covered so far. We started out in Colossians 1, which is our series called Jesus Is. And Colossians 1 is all about who Jesus is. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. We saw that Jesus is the king. He's the gift giver. All of these things that we learn about Jesus establishes just exactly theologically for us who Jesus is. And all that happens in chapter one and leads us into chapter two. Now, chapter two is the heart of the controversy. It's the reason why Paul is writing to the Colossian church. And in our series, More Than Enough, we addressed some of these issues. There were false teachers coming into the church. We were in this multicultural city of Colossae and all these different backgrounds and teachers are coming in and they're saying, Jesus is good, but you also have to eat certain things and you have to abstain from other things and you have to celebrate this festival and not this festival. There are deeper mysteries. There are hidden knowledge that you can, you can access if you will uh, deny yourself food. And, and Paul is saying, no, 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 look back to chapter one. Look who Jesus is. That's more than enough. You don't need to add anything to Jesus. You don't need to take anything away from Jesus. The gospel, as simple as it seems, is all that you need for salvation. And this leads us into chapter three, which is our series called For Me. And it starts with this verse, which I love. I love Paul starts chapter three with the phrase, if then you have been raised with Christ. And he is saying, I am speaking to those of you who have experienced new life in Jesus. And if you have this new life, we've seen who Jesus is. We've seen that he's more than enough. And now if you have this new life, God has a new life for me. He's got a new mind. We've, we've seen that he has, he has us putting off our old ways and our old sins and putting on this new wardrobe that he's purchased for us. And we see that that sanctification process spills over into every area of our life, into our marriages. It spills over into our parenting, right? All of these things, we have, we have traveled this road. And if you haven't noticed it yet, some of you are on top of this. I don't think I'm going to surprise you with it. What is the theme of Colossians? What is the one thing I want you to leave this series with? It's, it's simple. Jesus is more than enough for me. When someone asks you, what is Paul's letter to the Colossians about? Because people ask that a lot, by the way. All right. They don't really. If, if someone asks you, you can say, hey, Jesus is more than enough for me. And so today, 
we turn to something that would have been incredibly relevant and appropriate for the church at Colossae, which for us is going to be something that is really kind of distant and far away. It's hard for us to imagine, which is this topic of bond servants and masters. Now, I told you we're not going to avoid any of these things that scripture talks about. Bond servants and masters, why is that relevant? Well, in Colossae is a city in the Roman Empire, and in the Roman Empire alone, there are 60 million bond servants or slaves. And that's just the Roman Empire during the time of this writing. Across the world, there are many, many more than that. But in the Roman Empire, there are 60 million of them. If you want to know how close this hits home to Colossae, there is a book in the New Testament called Philemon. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul, he writes to this Christian man who is a slaveholder, and he sends it by way of a messenger. Now, this messenger's name is Onesimus. So Paul hands Onesimus this letter, says, hey, take this back to Philemon. And Philemon, when Onesimus hands him this letter, is very surprised for one reason. That's because Onesimus was Philemon's runaway slave. He had stolen something from Philemon, ran to Rome, which is about the best place to get lost. He meets the apostle Paul. He comes to meet Christ and Paul sends him back to Philemon and says, Philemon, this is Onesimus, no longer your slave, but your brother. Guess where Philemon and Onesimus live? Colossae. This was not an obscure and distant conversation. This was relevant. How is it that me accepting Christ and making him my Lord affects my daily life? And people within the church are both slaves and slaveholders. And so, of course, this is a topic that needs to be addressed. Now, if you were to ask me, just on the topic of slavery, if you were to ask me, does the Bible condone or promote the idea of having bond servants or slaves? My answer is an unequivocal no. I don't think that that is God's plan. I think that slavery is a result of sin and is a result of the fall. There will not be slavery in heaven. When God's ideal comes to pass, There will be no more slaves. It's a result of sin and the fall. And if you were to ask me this though, and this is where we're going to get real. If you were to ask me, okay, well, which chapter in verse specifically, universally, unequivocally says that all slavery is wrong? Well, that, that verse and chapter doesn't exist in the Bible. There is no statement like that. Now, I've already told you, I think that it's wrong, but we don't have a proof text. We don't have a single verse. And the Bible doesn't always work like that, does it? Where there's this single verse that handles every single issue. And so we have to be students of scripture. This is where I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pull out your notes and get ready to study what it is that God's word has to say. We have to be a student of scripture to understand exactly how the Bible addresses this issue of slavery. Now, what I want you to know and see primarily is that for whatever reason, God in his sovereignty, in his wisdom has chosen not to redeem humanity instantaneously, but instead to do this in a process over a long period of time. We'll call this the redemptive arc of history from Genesis to Jesus and from Jesus till he comes back. There is a redemption that is taking place progressively as God begins to awaken people's consciences to the fact that they have a a creator. And in this redemptive arc, we, we know that God has chosen not to just do this immediately because as soon as Adam and, in, as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God didn't immediately send Jesus, did he? For whatever reason, God has chosen to allow over time people to, to become aware of his presence. And here's how he does this. Anytime that we read in the Bible... Um, what we are seeing is a snapshot of history. And as God enters into this specific point in history, what God does is he reveals himself in his truth. And then over time, people become aware of this truth. 
People become aware of their own sinfulness and over time, and then God comes back in and he reveals himself again. So this is sort of the foundational context of what you need to understand, this idea of a redemptive arc, a progressive revealing of himself. Now, I want you to also understand that as Paul talks about bond servants or slaves and masters, it is very different than what we think of as slavery. When we think of slavery, oftentimes we're thinking of the colonial slave trade, which is a uniquely evil institution in which men, women, and children are kidnapped against their will, brought to a different country, and then they're forced to work as slaves forever. There's no hope of escape for them or their children. This is a unique form of evil and even made more unique in its evil because it was connected to an ethnicity. You see, in Paul's day, that's not how slavery was. It's not how it looked. We've already said there are 60 million slaves in Rome. That's, it's an incredible amount of slaves, 60 million, just for context, In 1860, in the United States, three years before the Emancipation Proclamation, there were just under 4 million slaves in the United States. And in Rome, there's 60 million. Now, what makes Roman slavery different? People weren't enslaved based on an ethnicity in Rome. That's one piece. People aren't enslaved for an indefinite period of time. That's another piece. There's no permanent underclass of human being. People were enslaved or sold as bond servants or uh, made bond servants for one of three reasons, if you want to write these down. Primarily one of three reasons, not exclusively. Primarily poverty, that was one. I can't actually afford to feed myself or my family. I can't put a roof over my head. So I will essentially sell myself into the service of another person in exchange for food and shelter. And their responsibility then is to teach me a skill And I will serve in that household for a determined period of time as I learn that skill. And then eventually, usually after six or seven years, if a person chooses to, they'll leave that household with their newfound skill and they can make a living and support themselves. That was one reason. Another reason was a a, a penalty, like judicial penalty. Someone broke the law. The Romans didn't just send people to jail and they didn't just kill people or stone people or crucify people. The Romans actually had a punishment where you could be made to be a servant for a determined, again, a determined period of time. And it wasn't based on any sort of ethnicity. And then the third reason, and this is the most common, people were made slaves because of debt, indebtedness. They owe money that they cannot pay back. And so they essentially sign a contract to enter into the house of the person that they owe that money to, and they will use their labor as repayment until that debt is paid back. Those are primarily the reasons. Other things that made Roman slavery different. In the Roman Empire, slaves held high positions, relatively speaking. It wasn't just manual labor. Slaves were teachers. They were doctors. They were lawyers. They were administrators within the government. Slaves weren't sequestered and held with chains on their ankles. They had social lives and they lived in society. Not only did they live within society, but they mixed with people who were free and people who were slaves. This is very different. You guys see that, right? Slavery in the ancient Near East, which is like Israel, was different as well. And so in the Old Testament, we see this process that takes place. God enters into history at a point in history to Israel in which slavery is everywhere. Every culture, every country is enslaving people. And God begins to do really some some incredible things. Number one, he regulates slavery. And with those regulations, he begins to radically transform the institution in itself. Some things that were unique about Israel when it comes to this topic. Israel, um, you couldn't enslave someone for life. There was a year of jubilee. You should study that. Every 49 years, every slave, no matter whether they had been serving for one year or six years or seven, every 49th year, every slave is freed and then they're all paid so that they'll not fall back into poverty and slavery again. Israel 
um, had a, a, a rule that God put in place that if there's a religious holiday, if there's a Sabbath, if there's a festival, slaves get to celebrate those just like anybody else. If you're partying, they're partying. If you're learning about God, they're learning about God. None of those distinctions take place. Israel itself was a no extradition country. If a runaway slave from a a surrounding country made it into Israel, Israel, God commanded them not to send that person back into bondage. They weren't allowed to send them back. Not only that, they were forced to care for them as if they were their brother and sister. This is radical. You understand this, right? This is a radical way of doing things. And because of these things, God in the Old Testament begins to sow seeds. And those seeds sort of sprout up over time. And you see this progressive, redemptive arc taking place. And the very foundations of slavery begin to erode. And things begin to change. All the way up until we get to the New Testament, when the Apostle Paul sends a letter back with a former slave to his owner. And he says, this isn't just your slave, he is your brother. We read this in Galatians, which is another city with plenty of slaves. We see this in Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. We see in Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, a reminder, the wrongdoer, they're talking about the, the, the owner, the slave master that cheats you, the wrongdoer is pay, will be paid back for the wrong that he has done, for there is no partiality. That means there is no partiality with God. God doesn't see slave and master. He doesn't see upper class, lower class. God doesn't see ethnicities the way that we see ethnicity. There is no partiality. And so what had been these seeds that were sowed that began to erode the foundations of slavery, Paul in the New Testament takes a jackhammer to that foundation and it erodes. And over time, we have now gotten to the place where, of course, to own a human being in 20th century or 21st century United States would seem unthinkable, wouldn't it? It's hard for us to even understand what Paul's talking about here. Why is he including this in in instructions to the household in Colossians? This is the redemptive arc of history. Now, we know that there is still slavery. It is our job as Christians to continue to fight for freedom wherever we see someone enslaved. And whether that is helping people out of addiction or whether that is, uh, you know, supporting Uh, women who are caught in sex trafficking, whether that is raising awareness, our job as Christians is wherever we see slavery, we promote the freedom of Jesus Christ. And someday when we see Jesus face to face in heaven, when we all live together in perfection, there won't be classes of people. You understand this, right? And so you see how I can say without a doubt that, no, of course the Bible doesn't sanction slavery. Now, I don't want to leave you just with a history lesson today. And so as I look at this passage, I see some things that I think will be incredibly helpful for us when it comes to our own lives. I know you're not slave owners and I know you're not slaves, but all of us can relate to what the Apostle Paul is talking about in 22 through 4.1 when it comes to work, can't we? All of us, every single one of us, unless we're one of the privileged few, will spend the majority of our adult lives working in some capacity. And so unless you're secretly like Scrooge McDuck with a swimming pool filled with gold coins somewhere, you're going to work. It's been said that we can roughly divide up our day into three eight-hour sections. Eight hours of sleep, yeah, right, okay eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, and eight hours of recreation. In John chapter 10, Jesus said that he came to give us an abundant life. I don't think that he was only talking about the eight hours of recreation. I think that what Jesus had in mind for us is abundance in our life and in our day-to-day, whether we're at work, whether we're at home, or whether we're sleeping. And so as we look back at this, I want us to look at what work could look like and what God's plan is for us when it comes to it. So 
Pull out your notebooks. We're going to keep taking notes here in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22, and we're going to go one verse at a time and see what it is that God says about our work and how we should approach it. Bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Can you guys say sincerity? Sincerity. I want you to think about that term, sincerity of heart. How is it that we are meant to work? No matter what job that we do, whether it is our school work or whether it is uh, construction work or whether it is intellectual work and research, one of the things that we are commanded to do is work with a sincere heart. You need to work with a sincere heart. Now, what does that look like? The Apostle Paul sort of gives us an understanding. He says that we work with a sincere heart, not as people pleasers when someone's eye is upon us. We can't just work hard when someone's watching and take a break when someone's not. That's not working with a sincere heart. This has become especially difficult in a day and age where so many of us work from home with almost no supervision. I can remember distinctly two a days. Man, if anybody ever went through a football two a day, let me see a hand. You know what I'm, you know, all right, this is for y'all. You guys understand this. At the end of a two a day, and understand we've been practicing since like seven in the morning and now it's four in the afternoon. And the coach yells and he says, all right, everybody on the line, which means, man, I'm exhausted, I'm dead, I'm hot, I'm tired, and now he wants me to run sprints. So what you do, high school kids, you didn't get this from me if you're football players, but what you do is you find the biggest group of people that you can, and all you do, you can just sort of put your hands on your knees, and as long as you're surrounded by everyone else, your goal is not to run faster than anyone else, but also not to run slower than anyone else. You just want to be in the middle of the pack. And so the coach blows the whistle and you sort of take off and you're looking left and right and you're making sure that you're kind of, you know, hidden. But then every once in a while, the coach, he comes and he stands right behind you with his whistle in his mouth. And I can tell you when that would happen, I'm not like this, I'm up. I'm ready, coach. And when he says, go, and he blows that whistle, I bounce off that line and I'm sprinting hard. Man, that's me being a people pleaser. That's me not working with a sincere heart. The challenge, of course, for any of us and all of us is what is it that we are supposed to do when it comes to our work, when we sincerely, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I sincerely do not care at all about what I'm doing. Because I've worked those jobs before. How do I have a sincere heart when I sincerely could care less about this job? It's a great question, isn't it? Well, God anticipated that question. And this is why he gave us the very next verse. He says that we, in verse 23, in whatever you do, you need to work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Woo, that hurts. Whatever it is that I am doing whether it's something that I think is important or something that I don't think is important, the way that I can work with a sincere heart is when I realize and recognize that I don't work for men. I don't even work for myself. I work for the Lord. I think about how different this world would be if we grasped this one concept. Man, every restaurant would be like Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? Can you imagine the customer service if it's Jesus out there? Like, whose kitchen are you renovating? Jesus's. I'm going to be on time. I'm going to be detail-oriented. I'm going to have my second cup of coffee. I'm going to be working hard. Can you imagine what kind of care you would get at the front desk of a hospital if Jesus walked in? I know how people would treat Taylor Swift. Imagine how you'd treat Jesus. And in everything that we do, we need to work as if we are working for the Lord. Because here's the truth. You want to know how to make your heart sincere? The truth is you are working for the Lord. The breath that you breathe is his. The abilities that he's given you are his. We think 
falsely, by the way, we think, especially when we're stuck in these jobs that are menial and that we don't like and that we sincerely don't care about, we think that, you know what, someday when I have an important job, I'll actually give it my all. But here's the truth. The Bible flips that on its head. Over and over it says, hey, you've got to be faithful with a little bit before you get a lot. And the same is true with our work. You know, somebody says to me, hey, man, I, if, I had a, if I won the Powerball, I would build this, you know, we, know we, need a, we need a church building, right? If I won the Powerball, I'd build that church. And I think to myself, you would do exactly what you do now. If you don't give now, you're not giving then. And if you don't work hard now at a job that you don't like, sincerely ask for the Lord, then there's not going to be some hypothetical day when you suddenly flip that switch. You be faithful where you are now. And that works as a teenager, that works as a high schooler, that works as somebody in their last days before retirement. Whatever you do, work as unto the Lord. We need to work with a sincere heart, and that comes when we realize that we work for Christ. The next verse is awesome. In verse 25, we actually read this, or verse 24 rather, we know that from the Lord we receive the inheritance as our reward because we are serving the Lord Christ. It's at this point that I'm reminded that Paul is actually writing to slaves, which is wild to me to think about. We think that our job is tough, right? Man, for hundreds of years and thousands of years, men and women who have been in bondage either because of debt or because of they were captured in war or unjustly have taken hope from passages like this. That no matter who the world says my master is, the truth is I work for the Lord. And in this world, I may be denied the things that I deserve. Odds are you will not be recognized for the work that you do in the way that you deserve it. That's just reality. Not only will you not be recognized, you probably won't be compensated in the way that you deserve. That's just reality. Some of you, some of us, will work our whole lives and we're not going to end up with the Scrooge McDuck pool. We're, just, we're maybe going to end up with an above ground one we bought at Walmart if we're lucky. Okay, that's reality. But the truth is not a single thing that you do goes unnoticed by God. There is this beautiful progression that takes place in the New Testament where we make ourselves bond servants of Jesus Christ. So that's a, that's a term that's used. Paul says that he made himself a bond servant to Christ. So think about this. And then what Jesus does is he looks at his disciples and he says, you're not my servants, you're my friends. And then there's a progression in the New Testament where we see that Jesus doesn't just call us friends, he calls us his sons and his daughters. And then he doesn't just say we're sons and daughters adopted into the family, he says that we are heirs with Christ. What a reward. We are bond servants, made friends, made brothers, made children, made heirs with Jesus Christ. You work for your eternal reward, my friends. Your servant is not whatever business name you're thinking of or whatever boss or whatever client. The person that you work for is Jesus and you work for that eternal reward. We work with sincere hearts Work for the Lord and work for an eternal reward. Not worried about the compensation here, but worried about the eternal reward that you have coming. And then the last thing is this. We see this in 25, verse 25 and in 4, 1, where Paul sort of turns his attention to the person who is the boss here. He says, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong that he has done. And there is no partiality. That means with God, there's no partiality. So masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Work with sincere hearts, work for the Lord, work for your eternal reward. And then the last thing is this, work justly because God is watching you. So many of us are in positions of responsibility over other people in our workplaces 
And whether you are responsible for others as a part of the police force or whether you're a shift leader at Chick-fil-A or whether you are a business owner with lots and lots of employees, if you are responsible for other people, then you will be held accountable to God for the way in which you treat them. So treat them with justice. Treat them the way that you want to be treated. Look out for their best interests, not only your best interests, their best interests. Help them to become the very most that they can become in this world. If you have ever had a boss that cared more about you than about money, you've never forgotten it, have you? If you ever had a boss that cared more about you, the person, than the work that you did, you have never forgotten that boss. Be that person to the people who work for you. And I promise you, this is what God has for me. He has abundance in your work life. If you can work with a sincere heart for the Lord with your eternal reward in mind and you work justly knowing that God is watching, your workplace can become a place of abundance as well. God begins to transform your heart and your life and you can watch because when we're faithful with those small things, God often gives us more, more people, more responsibility, more opportunities. And so that's my encouragement for us today. Now, in just a moment, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I know that oftentimes our volunteers leave during this prayer to go get prepped for the next service, which is coming in at 11, but we're going to have a building update after we pray. So I want to invite you to just stick around for a few minutes, if you would. Let's pray together. Lord, we just come to you now. Lord, I know that uh, this redemptive arc of history even includes work. Lord, work was meant to be a curse in the garden, and yet we can see in our own lives that work can be redeemed as well. Jesus, in my own life, I've worked good jobs that I loved and jobs that I hated, and I've been ashamed of myself for the way that I've treated the jobs I hated. Lord, I've forgotten at times in my life that I work not for men, but for you. But there's such joy in working for you, Jesus. Knowing that you don't call me a servant, but that you call me a son. Thank you. Thank you that we have this promise of a better life than this one. This life, there is a lack of justice. I don't, we don't get what we deserve. People cheat us. Lord, people overlook all the contributions that we make. People don't appreciate us the way that they should. But Lord, I thank you for this promise in this passage that someday we receive a reward. That we are not overlooked or forgotten, God, but that every, every day that we spend, we spend under your watchful eye. Lord, I pray that the men and women in this room would be different in their workplaces. It's often the hardest place, Lord. It's often such a sanctifying place for us. It shows us our sinfulness. It challenges us. But Lord, I pray that we would be different because we don't just work hard while people watch us. We work with a sincere heart knowing that we work for you. Lord, we don't get bitter and angry about the things we don't have, but we remember that we work for an eternal reward that is better and held in heaven. And Lord, I pray that we would work justly, knowing that every move that we make is watched by a God in heaven and that you have no partiality. We love you and we thank you for your faithfulness in all seasons to all of us. Jesus, give us strength. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. Let us look different because we carry the name of Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen.